All right, guys, what's up? It's your boy. Today we're gonna to be watching and reacting to a video by a YouTuber by the name of Invaders. Check out his content. You know, check out the video, subscribe, shout out Invaders. Hope you don't mind me going over your video. Now I've heard a lot of good things about this video. I've heard some good reviews, uh, and it's it's a it's a in defense of Aaron's character and his choices in the manga, specifically. This video is an hour and a half long, guys. It's a long video. So we're going to be here for a while. <laughs> now, I've never watched this video before, but I already kind of can get an idea of what it's about based on the reactions that have come up from it. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch it, and I'm going to pause it and when I have something to say, when I have comments to make. Uh, but we're going to hear all his arguments. We're going to hear and see what he has to say. Maybe he's... Maybe he just cracked the code on why the ending wasn't stupid. So let's let's hear it out. Let's see what he has to say. Um, let's go ahead and get it started because this is gonna be a long video. This may be my longest video ever, actually. Even if all of this was what I wanted, and I'm not getting paid for it at all. Everything is still ahead. Copyrights already. He didn't get paid for this either, though. That's crazy. When Attack on Titan ended, many people were quick to decide that the ending was terrible. Even beyond that, many people accused it of being retconned, that for whatever reason, Isayama had backed out of his vision at the last minute, creating a new ending and scrapping what he had spent a decade planning. At the heart of that discussion was Aaron himself. The conclusion of his arc and the reveal of his motivations led many people to believe his character had been inexplicably ruined right at the end. For a time, I myself was one of the people who believed that. I hated the ending and I hated what I felt like it had done to Aaron. But as the months passed, and as I continued to discuss the ending with more and more people, I began to come to a realization. Not only is the belief that the ending was retconned entirely incorrect, but the ending we got was the only logical conclusion the story could have had. Ooh. More specifically, and what I'm going to be focusing on in this video, That's a claim. is that Aaron's conclusion was not only logical and natural, but also fantastic inventive writing that truly elevated his character to a level very few could have foreseen. No Could've matter foreseen. how you feel about the ending or Aaron's conclusion, for the next hour and a half, I'd like Ooh. to ask you to forget everything you think you know about the series. I'm, I'm, I'm Aaron with you, Invaders. It's not only a deep dive of the entire story. This is going to be a long one, guys. This is going to be a long video. Preconceptions and I should have probably streamed this. If you can do that, I think you'll find that Aaron's arc is a fascinating piece of character writing grounded in philosophy, with a lot to say about the meaning of freedom. Bro, trust me, it absolutely is. We all agree with you there. <laughs> Until 139, that's the problem. But, but, but let's hear what you got to say, man. My intention with this video is to definitively close the book on the controversies and the many, many misunderstandings that have prevailed in the discourse surrounding Aaron. Okay. This video is also designed to be timeless, able to be watched no matter whether you're watching this after the anime is concluded or if it's still ongoing. Once again, remember to keep an open mind as you join me on this exhaustive look at almost every aspect of Aaron's characterization as I Gotta try to uncover the meaning of what Isayama truly wanted to say with his writing. And remember, while these are the conclusions I've reached, you're free to disagree, and I encourage you to comment any differing oh, interpretations oh. you have after watching. Oh yes, I will. Before anything else, we need to be on the same page about Aaron's arc spanning the first two-thirds of the story. Aaron's character is impossible to understand unless you have a full comprehension of his motivations and character growth prior to the time skip. While you may feel like you already have a solid understanding of this, there's a good chance that you've missed crucial aspects of his character that will drastically Oof. impact your understanding later on. Oof. I would highly so, recommend. So, so we starting off. We starting off with the. We starting off with the. You probably didn't understand the story argument. We starting off with that. All right. And not skipping through any of this. No matter how I'm not well you feel like you understand moment. it. With that I out of the way, let's hear what you gotta say, begin. baby. Let's get it. Mistaken freedom. Okay. Attack on Titan began as a very simple story, and Aaron's characterization matched that simplicity. In the beginning, his single goal was to wipe out the Titans, the monsters that had stolen humanity's freedom. But Aaron didn't question what the Titans were or why they did what they did. Aaron fought them because he knew that once the Titans were gone, humanity would have its freedom back. With this baseline characterization established, every new development of the story began to test his single-minded understanding little by little. While he had thought their enemies were simple monsters, it became clear that there was something more behind the Titans when it was revealed that he himself had the power to become one of them. 
Later, he learned that his own friends were the ones who had destroyed the walls. Soon after, it was revealed that every single one of the mindless titans was a human trapped against their will. And by the Uprising arc, it was clear that the greatest threat to humanity was itself. Every one of these developments raised more questions about the nature of their conflict. Who were they actually fighting against? Aaron began to ask himself that question. And that question would be answered upon reaching the basement. In the basement were books that contained the truth of their world that had been kept hidden. This discovery would flip Aaron's perception of the world on its head, forcing him to confront his own worldview, drastically altering the direction of his character arc from that point on. Yes, sir. To understand why it affected him to such an extreme, and before we can talk about the basement, we also need to understand Aaron's twisted concept of freedom, and what exactly being free meant to him. Hmm. Okay. Growing up, Aaron was a normal kid who didn't question the world around him, and he accepted things as they were. He didn't have the characteristic drive for- Huh? Huh? Let me hear that one more time, because I feel like I missed, I feel like I may have. Growing up, Aaron was a normal kid who didn't question the world around him, and he accepted things as they were. What? Let me, okay, let me, maybe he's going to explain why he said that, he's going to back that up. Let me, let me, let me, let me finish, let me finish. He didn't have the characteristic drive for freedom that we know him for. However, he was exceptionally bored with the uneventful world in front of him. Despite that, he had no aspirations to go outside the walls, nor to join the scouts. Okay. But, but just, just be... What we need to uncover uh, then is when and why Aaron's transfixion on freedom began. Okay, okay so, so he's, he's talking, talking about... about okay, okay, so he's, he's talking, talking about, about before Armin showed in the book. book. I guess, okay. okay. If that's that's desire for freedom on. is an inherent part of him, but it's something that wasn't awakened until the day he realized that he wasn't free. Okay. That realization occurred when Armin okay. showed him that's a book right. about the outside okay. world. Right. I was, learned about I was already like, well, he lost me. me. Okay. okay, no, you're, no, you're right. right. That's, that's right. right. That's correct. That's right. 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 No, that's absolutely right. right. You're right. I should have listened to Gary's before I react that way. My B. I just thought he was tripping already. Aaron was entranced as he listened to Armin speak about his dream, but he didn't understand what exactly Armin was captivated by. Armin's dream was simple. He wanted to explore the outside world. The things in the book looked amazing to him, and he was driven by a sense of wonder at what could be out there. Aaron did not have the same sense of wonder. What Aaron saw in the book, and how he interpreted it, was fundamentally different. Instead of feeling curiosity, for Aaron, the book only showed him his own lack of freedom. Mm -hmm. Instead of seeing wondrous landscapes filled with mystery, Aaron only saw the vast, empty earth that had been taken from them. Yep. Yep. That's he right. felt no wonder nor curiosity at the prospect of seeing it. Absolutely he only right. wanted the freedom that taking it back would give him. Later, Aaron thought more about what he had learned, and his hatred began to grow. Aaron had learned from the book what had been taken from them, and mm -hmm. that he was not free. Mm -hmm. By extension, Aaron decided, it must mean that someone who was able to see the things that had been taken away from them was free. For Aaron, freedom was something inherent that everyone had at the moment of birth and could only be taken away by outside factors. Aaron sought freedom because he was born with it, and it had been taken away from him. That would become the motivation for Aaron's actions going forward. His overwhelming will to fight would be driven by the desire to see the empty, free world that lay beyond the walls. In fact, Aaron's desire for freedom can be summed up as the desire to see what was depicted in Armin's book. Because for Aaron, freedom itself is what was depicted in the book, and he would not be free until he had seen it for himself. In a sense, Aaron's drive for freedom was a corruption of Armin's childlike wonder. For each of them, freedom meant something vastly different. For Armin, it represented curiosity, wonder, and hope, the main values of the Survey Corps. But for Aaron, freedom was something inherent that had been stolen from him, and his lack of it brought him outrage towards their world. And this differing understanding of what they were fighting for would inevitably lead to conflict between the two of them. 
pitting Aaron against the Survey Corps and what they fought for. <laughs> After reaching the basement, the truth of the outside world was finally revealed. In the ideal scenario Aaron had constructed in his mind, this would be the end of his journey, and the point at which he would finally be free. Outside of the walls lies the world depicted in Armin's book. After defeating the Titans, humanity would retake their territory and finally be free. That's the happy ending that Aaron had envisioned for himself and for his friends. But Attack on Titan is not that kind of story. There was no such promised scenery outside of the walls. What was actually out there was a world much, much worse than anyone in the walls could have imagined. It was a world controlled by the same enemies who sent the Titans to slaughter them. A world in which they were thought of as monsters who needed to be wiped out. In a world in which children were fed alive to dogs. At that moment, the truth set in. The freedom he had seen depicted in Armin's book had always been an idyllic fantasy that never existed. There had never been freedom past the walls. Aaron's journey until now had been one in which his view of the world had been constantly tested. And in the near future, he would come to understand that the people he thought of as his enemies were no different from himself. In other words, Aaron's journey had been one of gaining understanding and empathy. However, Aaron's pursuit of freedom was antithetical to the very understanding he had spent so long developing. Aaron's very idea of freedom was based on the assumption that their conflict was a simple one, in which defeating the Titans was enough to achieve freedom. Aaron had gained empathy, but he was still someone who inherently valued freedom above almost all else. And the freedom he sought did not exist in a complicated world like theirs. And with that contradiction, a dilemma had formed in Aaron's mind. Aaron's attempt to reconcile the difference between his ideal freedom and the reality of the world would become the new driving force of his actions. <laughs> Knowing fully what freedom meant to Aaron, we can now grasp exactly what he was asking with this question. Aaron was not asking when the fighting would be over, but rather if the freedom he sought could be obtained if the outside world was wiped clean. At that See? moment, Armin in awe at the sight of the... See, See that? that? Okay. okay. I, I get where, I get where, you're, where you're coming, coming from, from with that, that right? If Aaron's ideals of freedom were being able to access these things in the book and go wherever he wants to go without anyone attacking him equals freedom, then okay. But he's already seen a fair amount of things that Armin put in the book. He just saw the ocean, which was the biggest thing that they wanted to see. And he didn't care. He didn't even, he didn't even, he wasn't even happy to see the ocean. So... What you're saying doesn't line up. What you're saying that the only way Aaron would be happy would be that he had to see every single one of these things, which I don't think that that's where Aaron was coming from at all. I think he was referring to people actually trying to kill them. <laughs> because if he wasn't, then why doesn't he celebrate when he sees the ocean? That's, that would be a landmark regardless of whether or not he could see it all or not. It's just, just one, it's one thing, thing, I give you that, that but I, I feel, feel like, like he's happier. The ocean saw Aaron's expression. He didn't want to admit it, but he understood. He and Aaron did not share the same dream. Experiencing this simple moment was enough for Armin, but Aaron wanted something more. And that desire from Aaron brings us to the main topic. But, 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 but it's, it's not, not just Aaron's desire. desire. Like, it's, it's not, not like these guys, guys are not going to keep trying to kill them. Aaron knows that, Armin knows that, even in this part of the story, Armin knows that. So why are we acting like they're supposed to just pretend like everything's all good? Aaron's not, Aaron is thinking about, we're still in danger technically. This is not a time to play. I'm not, I'm not satisfied 
with, with pretending like, like everything's okay in my life. I was, I, I was done with that when I, when I became a scout. I don't want to do that anymore. Like, I want to face reality. You guys can play in the water all you want to, but these guys want us dead. So, I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm all about that. Let's see. Aaron could not accept that the world outside of the walls was different from the free world he had imagined. And because of that discrepancy, Aaron used the rumbling to destroy the world, not out of necessity, but because it was what he wanted to do. This revelation can be hard to believe at first, or even seem like an outright retcon. When you explore deep into Aaron's character, however, you begin to realize that this is the only place Aaron's story could have gone from the very beginning. See, I would believe you. I would. If it wasn't for chapter 131, I promise you I believe you. 131 kind of puts a wrench in this whole thing. It does, let's and how this spend desire 10 minutes. is the only logical endpoint of his obsessive desire for freedom. Whether or not you like this part of the story is ultimately subjective, but I believe that this is an incredibly well written, fascinating, and unique character motivation that deserves to be acknowledged for what it is. While it could not be immediately appreciated by most after finishing the story for the first time, I believe that this is one of the greatest aspects of ARP and elevated Aaron to a truly timeless character. I'm getting ahead of myself, but yeah. I feel the need to say this now. I am not saying that the only reason Aaron did what he did was because it was what he wanted, but I am arguing that it was his primary motivation. Like all complex characters, Aaron has several layers of reasoning behind all of his actions, and I'm not going to ignore the rest of his characterization. We'll get to the rest as the video progresses. After understanding the true meaning of Aaron's desire for freedom, many events of the story retroactively make more sense, and are recontextualized. I want to start by going over one of the most important of these moments, as well as one of the most important character dynamics in the series. So let's talk about the relationship between Aaron and Reiner. Many have said this before, but Aaron and Reiner are truly two sides of the same coin, and understanding the actions of one will help us understand the actions of the other. To start, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about Reiner, and his motivation for doing what he did. Reiner was born in a Liberio internment zone from an Eldian mother and a Marlean father. Growing up, his mother promised him that becoming an honorary Marlean would let the two of them live with his estranged father. The status of Honorary Marleyan was awarded to any warrior and their family, granting them permission to live outside of the internment zone. Honorary Marleyans were the exception to Eldian oppression. It was the one way for an Eldian to gain the acceptance and respect of Marley. With that in mind, Reiner devoted himself to becoming a warrior. If only he could become Marley's hero, he thought, then surely he would gain the approval of his father. Going to him before the mission began, he realized that the acceptance he thought he would gain with his new role couldn't be found with his father. The notion that his dad would love him just because he was an honorary Marleyan now had been naive. Yeah. Yeah. But, he told himself, even if his father didn't love him, he could still become a hero to the entire world and gain acceptance that way, even if it wasn't with his father. He led the mission to destroy Wall Maria with that in mind. His mm -hmm. devotion to his dream only increased from that point. He convinced himself that his new friends were the evil people that Marley had told him they would be. But as time passed, he knew more and more that it wasn't true, and that the propaganda had all been a lie. He loved his new friends, and with them he even found acceptance. But even despite that, it was Reiner who made the decision to kill Marco in cold blood, and it was he who led the mission to destroy Wall Rose. His dream of becoming a respected hero of the world outweighed everything else, even leading him to cast aside what was right in front of him and so Reiner betrayed his morals to seek what he wanted. But even still, after casting everything aside, Reiner could not obtain what he sought. In the end, after being rejected by the world, he had nothing left, and nothing to live for. Four years after the warrior's defeat, Aaron began living in Marley. Having no basis on which to judge the people of the outside world aside from Grisha's memories, he still saw them as his enemies. But as he lived alongside them, he discovered the same truth that Reiner had once learned. The people of Marley were no different than the people inside of the walls. Aaron realized that Reiner had once lived with the enemy as he was doing now, and he began to think about how Reiner must have felt doing so. He recalled the moment that Reiner betrayed him, and what Reiner had said. <laughs> I 
ソヤローにならずに進んだのに He thought back to Reiner's contradictory behavior, putting his life at risk for the people who he was there to kill. He remembered the compassion that Reiner had shown to everyone, despite having been supposedly brainwashed from birth. Aaron thought that Reiner must have come to the same conclusion that he had. There are no devils, only people. Everyone in the walls, and in Marley, is fundamentally the same. Only that would explain his contradictory behavior. Reiner was no longer under the influence of Marley's propaganda. But if Reiner had come to that understanding, then why had he still made the choice to destroy Wall Rose? He had no proof, but he had a suspicion he knew exactly why Reiner had chosen to destroy the wall, and if he was right, it meant that he and Reiner were exactly alike. Aaron's assumption was that Reiner knew it was wrong to kill the people of the walls, but still did it anyways, not because of propaganda, but because it was what he wanted. With that in mind, he confronted Reiner to hear the truth for himself. The conversation that followed can only be fully understood with the context I've laid out for you, so we'll be going through it line by line. Keep in mind that I have to cut up this scene to be able to show it, so please bear with the choppiness. Aaron referred to what Reiner said on the day the two of them met. It's important to understand that Aaron confronted Reiner with the assumption that he was correct about Reiner's motivation. With hindsight, we know that when Reiner said, to save the world, what he actually meant was that he was there for his own dream, while using to save the world as a justification. Aaron had already come to this realization about Reiner's actions. We can infer then, that when Aaron said, the same thing as you, he was not saying he had a plan for saving the world. Rather, Aaron was saying he was going to do the same thing Reiner did, and while using the same excuse that Reiner had. Aaron knew that if he was right about Reiner's motivation, then Reiner would correctly interpret this statement as a threat that Aaron was there to kill them. Reiner did interpret it as a threat, but not for the right reason. Because Reiner was under the presumption that Aaron was here to carry out the promise he had made four years ago. <laughs> What Reiner had yet to realize was that Aaron no longer viewed him as an enemy that needed to be killed. Aaron now understood him perfectly. And because Reiner had yet to make that connection, he had yet to understand the nature of Aaron's threat. Terrified by what he perceived as Aaron's bloodthirsty desire for revenge, Reiner struggled to respond. <laughs> This was his second hint, and his second attempt to make Reiner understand exactly what he intended on doing. But Aaron was right. Reiner didn't get it. They listened to Willie's speech for a while. Eventually, Aaron spoke again, after Willie revealed the purpose of the Parody Island operation and the threat of the Wall Titans. Aaron now switched into weaponizing Reiner's guilt. He gave Reiner an easy out, that his actions were the result of propaganda. But that was too easy of an excuse, to the point it must have been humiliating for Reiner, who'd spent the last four years in regret over the choices he had made. Aaron, of course, knew the answer to this question already. The goal of the question was to increase the pressure further. But Reiner again didn't understand that, and interpreted it as a genuine question from someone who he perceived as not understanding the world. Reiner reluctantly once again lied about his reasoning. This time Aaron replied by outright mocking Reiner's canned response. Reiner could not take the pressure any longer. He knew Aaron must be here to kill him. Having enough of the mind games, Reiner wanted a direct answer. But Aaron's response was not anything like Reiner expected. Oh, 
海の向こう側にあるものすべてが敵に見えるそして今海を渡って敵と同じ屋根の下で敵と同じ飯を食べる Referring to how Reiner once did the same and learned the same lesson, he said, At that moment, Reiner finally realized that Aaron now understood his enemies. He's the same as me, Reiner thought. But Reiner had yet to take the next logical step in that line of reasoning. That Aaron was going to do the same as him and kill his enemies despite what he had learned. Aaron now moved on to pressure Reiner for the final time. He knew that if he was right, Reiner's guilt, especially after realizing Aaron alone could understand his suffering, would be too great for him not to repeat what Aaron was about to say. <laughs> Under the pressure and the guilt of being pardoned for actions that were of his own choice, Reiner finally gave in. Reiner desperately wanted to be judged for his crimes, for the guilt that was eating away at him every day. And Aaron, who would come to understand him, would be the one to end his suffering. This was the confession that Aaron had been waiting for. Aaron realized then that everything was exactly as he had assumed. <laughs> Just as Aaron had suspected, Reiner knew perfectly well that the people of the walls didn't deserve to die, but he chose to kill them anyway out of his own volition. Not because Reiner was brainwashed or believed it was the right thing to do, but because it was what he wanted for himself. And with that, we can now understand the true meaning of this line. Reiner was not saying that he regretted his actions after realizing they were good people. What Reiner actually meant in that moment was that he wished he had not come to understand the people of the walls. As he could no longer kill them with a clear conscience. But what Aaron would say next would change everything. <laughs> Reiner was taken aback. He had expected to be judged, but Aaron said something he didn't anticipate. After Reiner himself confessed his reasons for the horrible things he had done, Aaron responded by saying, I'm the same as you. And it was likely at that moment that Reiner realized Aaron was not here to absolve him of his sins. Aaron, now satisfied that he understood Reiner and having someone to share his own sin with, began his attack that would lead to the destruction of the world. But it would still be some time before Reiner would understand Aaron and the full meaning of the conversation that they shared underneath the stage. Okay, so let's break that down. I mean, everything he said was right. Um, and, and it's a very uh, interesting point that he made there is that obviously when Reiner said, um, I'm, I, I did it for me, like I did it because I wanted to do it. It wasn't because the world, I wasn't trying to save the world. I wasn't trying to help anybody. It wasn't because I was brainwashed. I knew what I was doing. I made the choice on my own. That's what he's saying. So Aaron's saying, I'm the same as you. I wasn't brainwashed. I know there's good people here. I'm making this choice because I want to do it. But just because Aaron wants to do it doesn't mean he wants to do it just because he wants to destroy the world. Like, just because he wants the thrill of destroying the world. That's the part where I'm not, that's the part where you're not making the connection. I get that he wanted to destroy the world. Of course he wanted to. But why did he want to? Not because just not because it was something that was fun for him, not because he just was this angry person, this psychopath that again it seems that you're going down that path, but I don't know, still haven't made that connection yet. I need to I need to know what makes Aaron what makes Aaron want to destroy the world other than to uh free his people. 
what what is his primary motivation for destroying the world? Where is the evidence that connects that to just simply being that he's just a psychopath? I need that by the time this video is over. I am just me. I always have been. If someone tries to steal my freedom away, I won't hesitate to take theirs. Our father didn't make me that way. I've been like this since birth. Why is Aaron the way that he is? Why does he want to be free, and where did that desire come from? Answering those questions is the key to understanding the point of Aaron's character. And to answer them, we have to discuss the concepts of dreams, free will, and inherent nature. Those were Zeke's first words to Aaron after finally meeting him. Grisha had been raised by Zeke to be an Eldian restorationist, and he assumed that their father had done the same thing to Aaron. But as they explored Grisha's life together in Pax, it became clear that Grisha had raised Aaron as a normal child. As someone whose entire life and ideology had been shaped by others, Zeke didn't understand how it was possible for Aaron to be the way he was without any outside influence. Zeke never understood, but the reason for this was because Aaron was someone who was a slave to his own nature. But what does that mean? To begin to understand that question, let's first look at an interview Isayama did in 2017. In the interview, he talked about some of his inspirations for AOT. One of these was a manga called Himianole. I'd like to share an excerpt from this interview in which Isayama talked about his thoughts on the series. When I read Himianole, I knew society would consider the serial killer in the story unforgivable under social norms. But when I took into account his life and background, I still wondered, if this was his nature, then who's to blame? I even thought, is it merely a coincidence that I wasn't born as a murderer? We justify what we absolutely cannot accomplish as a flaw due to lack of effort, and there is bitterness within that. On the other hand, for a perpetrator, having the mindset of, it's not because I lack effort that I became like this, is a form of solace. In other words, the way we're born is out of our control. Is it a murderer's fault if it's in their nature to murder? If not, then who's to blame? Is it just a coincidence that you and I were not born as someone with the inherent desire to kill? This question is at the center of the moral dilemma being explored with Aaron's inherent nature. Aaron was born with the dream of being free, and as a consequence, was born with the desire to destroy the unfree world. If it was in Aaron's nature to destroy the world, is he still to blame? Looking at it from that perspective, one can argue that Aaron was never free to begin with. Aaron was a slave to his own nature and the dream of freedom it created, and in the end he could do nothing to stop it. Okay. <laughs> this slave to your thoughts and your slaves to your witches and slaves to who you are as a person and shit is... is, is uh, this, I've heard this argument before. I get where you're coming from. I do. I get where you're coming from. Like like Kenny said, everyone's a slave to something. Okay. When you, when you really want to achieve a goal, when you let that goal take over your mind, or like, or even in this situation, when you're when you're just naturally born as a murderer, then you're a slave. But 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 then that means everyone is a slave. That means everyone is a slave because everyone has something that they're fighting for. Everyone has something that they mentally. So if everyone is slave, no one is free. So what's the point of the word slave or free? What's the point of it? It it, it it doesn't make sense to me, man. It doesn't. It, it, it not, it's not clicking. Like it by your logic. By your logic. This is your logic here, right? If we we let's, let's say I was a slave, right? And my master was like, "Boy, get out there and go, go, go pick them crops. I need, or, or, or pick that cotton. I need to sell my cotton, and so I can make this money." I'd be like, "Well, master, <laughs> I may be a slave, but you're a slave to cotton. You're a slave to money. You're a slave to your cotton sale job. <laughs> okay, that's fine. You're the one getting your ass whipped. You're the one who's under." threat of death if you don't do what I tell you to do. You're the one who has to work in the hot sun all day. You're the one who has to sleep in a fucking pile of shit. <laughs> You're the one who I can take your family away at any time. 
you're the one who doesn't have the choice to stop. I can stop this slavery whenever I feel like it. I can let y'all go and go do something else in my life. You can't do that. But I'm the slave. It makes no sense. It makes no logical sense. We're not talking about a, a, a theoretical slave to my mind here. We're talking about literally slaves. Like as in, I cannot stop doing this. If, even if I wanted to, I can't. It's not my mentality. It's physical things around me that are stopping me from being able to do what I want to do. For example, Aaron, I want to go here. I can't because if I do, they will kill me. <laughs> I just don't get it. I don't understand. I don't understand. I just keep watching. We got an hour really left, boys. It's already been if, 30 if minutes. Holy shit, this is about to be a long video. So I'd like to ask the question... Why do any of us act the way that we do? I think most people's first answer would be that our actions and behavior are a result of the life experiences we've had that have shaped our personality and opinions. Probably. Others will say that the way we act is due to our own nature, that some people are born good or evil. Others still Could will say a it's a combination of the two. I would say a combo. Regardless of where their personality came from, most people act within their own morals and beliefs. Mm -hmm. Does that mean none of us have the freedom to act outside of those values? Absolutely not. If we can't act outside of those values, does that mean all of us lack true free will? By extension then, does that mean that we shouldn't hold ourselves at fault for our own character flaws? No. Personally, Absolutely I think not. it's ridiculous to say that we can't be held accountable for our own actions right. just because of the parts of our personalities that are out of our control. Right. I think most people would agree. Isayama certainly isn't saying that Aaron is free of the consequences of his actions either. But I think at the very least, this is an interesting question to think about, and we'll talk about it more later in the video. One very, very important thing to make clear is that while Aaron's characterization is an exploration of inherent nature, the extent to which every character is controlled by their own nature is not the same. Zeke in particular is one character whose identity, goals, and dream were shaped by the actions of others, which is exactly why Aaron, who'd been completely free of ideological influence, was someone who Zeke could never understand. Together, the two brothers were an exploration of nature versus nurture. I'm saying this because, again, it's important to understand that not every character in the story is a commentary on inherent nature. Aaron is a unique case of someone whose ideology and dream were formed by his own uninfluenced nature the moment he was born. Zeke is the opposite. But other than those two, the vast majority of the characters aren't used as an exploration of this topic. Aaron is a very unique character in how his inherent nature is explored and how it affects the story. What is brought up and explored with many characters in the story, however, is the concept of the dream. While Aaron's dream was a result of his own inherent nature, that is not true in every case. Which brings us to Kenny Ackerman, whose life and death embody this concept. Understanding Kenny is necessary to understanding the final message of the story. Unlike Aaron, Kenny's character was not an exploration of inherent nature. Whether Kenny's personality was a result of his own inherent nature, or his learned behavior, is irrelevant. What Kenny is relevant to the ending, rather, has to do with his dream, and the conclusion he reached about it just before his death. When the final chapter came out, the chapter in which Kenny's life was explored was republished alongside it. That wasn't a coincidence. This chapter is one of the most important of the entire series, and without it the message of the story wouldn't be complete. Kenny was once a mass murderer bent on revenge for the persecution of his family. He lived a life of misery and self-hatred, but even still the one thing he prided himself on was being the strongest around. But one day Kenny met Yuri Race, the king of the walls at the time. Yuri easily stopped Kenny's attack, grabbing him in his titan hand. Kenny prepared for death and begged for mercy, having finally met someone whose power couldn't defeat. However, something unexpected happened. Yuri released him and begged for Kenny's forgiveness for what the royal family had done to the Ackermans. This encounter awakened a new dream in Kenny. Yuri, who had all the power in the world, was bowing to a man who'd been reduced to powerlessness before him. But why? Kenny decided that Yuri's godlike, unstoppable power gave him the luxury to be kind, even towards murderous scum like himself. Kenny, who was full of self-hatred but lacking the means to better himself, then decided, if I can become as powerful as Yuri, I can become kind as well. Kenny would spend the next 20 years in pursuit of his dream, ironically becoming a much crueler person and growing further and further from the kindness he sought. 
After Rod's transformation in the chapel, Kenny was gravely wounded. Bleeding out, he encountered his nephew Levi. In his hands, he had a Titan injection that he'd stolen from Rod. He realized that he could save his own life at the cost of being turned into a real monster. But in his dying moments, Kenny began reflecting on his life. Kenny had never understood Yuri's kindness, but he finally realized why Yuri had acted the way that he did. They had all been a slave to a dream that gave them the strength to keep pushing on. But every time, those dreams had consumed those that dreamed them. Kenny realized that if he were to use this injection on himself, he would also be consumed by his own dream, having never achieved the kindness that he wanted. And in his last moments, Kenny let go of his dream, handing the injection to Levi in his first act of genuine selflessness. And with that action, Kenny finally found peace. It was only through letting go of his dream that Kenny was able to avoid the self-destruction of those who had come before him, and only by letting go of his dream was he able to achieve the kindness that he wanted. Kenny lived his life controlled by his own dream. He was a violent person, but he was someone whose dream was to defy that violence. What makes Kenny especially interesting is that at the end of his life he was able to overcome his own dream. It may be correct to say that in that way, Kenny gained true freedom. In contrast, Aaron was someone who lived his entire life controlled by his dream, and ultimately Aaron would not have the strength to let go of his dream and was consumed by it. We'll come back to talk more about that later, but for now, there's one more aspect of Aaron's nature that we need to talk about. Attack on Schoolcast is an alternate universe joke manga created by Isayama. Two panels from Schoolcast were released at the back of every new volume for the last several years of AOT's run. And as time passed, the panels began to tell a coherent story. There's a lot to analyze from Schoolcast, but for the sake of what I'm talking about, we only need to focus on the Schoolcast version of Eren. Isayama has said before that Schoolcast would be relevant to understanding the main story, and I believe that this is what he was talking about. In the Schoolcast universe, we see a different version of Eren. He's still the same character, but he lives in a world where he isn't restricted by walls and has never had to fight for freedom. This version of Eren was already free, and by analyzing him in that context, we can get a better understanding of his nature. In this world without freedom to fight for, Eren was profoundly bored. Just like the Eren of the main universe before he discovered his own lack of freedom, this Eren longed for something interesting to happen. One night, Eren had a dream where a zombie apocalypse began. Without realizing it was a dream, his personality immediately switched to the pre-time skip Eren that we knew. The zombies, of course, were meant as a representation of the titans from before we learned anything about them. This dream is of a world where Eren is most at peace, fighting for freedom in a simple world with clear good guys and bad guys, with no moral dilemma in fighting his enemies. After waking up from the dream and finding out that none of it was real, he realized that he'd returned to his boring life. He started to cry, saying he couldn't take any more of a life like this. But later, as Eren reflected on his dream, his inherent nature began to come through. Ever since I had that dream about the zombies, I haven't been able to stand this boring life where nothing happens. Of course humanity isn't in danger of being annihilated. It's impossible. A dream that ridiculous would never... No, wait. If the danger doesn't exist, then I could just cause it myself. A threat to all of humanity. Let's summarize exactly what the implications of this are. No matter the place, as long as he wasn't free and realized that fact, Aaron would always long for freedom. Without the need to long for freedom, he would be immeasurably bored with the world. In his boredom, he would long for a world without freedom, just so that he could fight for it. Aaron would go as far as wanting to destroy a free world, just to create one where he had an excuse to fight for freedom. This is one of now, you, you, <clears throat> this is all um, very good point. Absolutely. Can't argue against it. Except, Schoolcast is not in the story of Attack on Titan. It's a separate thing. It's not in the anime. So, this is not enough. You, you can say whatever you want in the Schoolcast, whatever you want to put in it, you can, you can put that there. 
you can put it as hints or whatever you want to say but if the story doesn't put these hints into play other than just Aaron being bored when he was a kid it's not enough definitely not enough but I see where you're coming from the most critical aspects of his character that you must understand this was Aaron's nature no matter the circumstances and it could not be changed it had been a part of him since the moment he was born school cast was the last piece of the puzzle that you needed Aaron had always been like this it was not Aaron who changed but it was us and how we perceived him after his attack on Marley Aaron seemed to have changed into a cold-blooded killer but that wasn't true Aaron had always been this way because his character growth conflicted with his inherent nature Aaron remained fundamentally the same character from the first chapter until the very last one while Aaron did grow as a person throughout his journey in the end he rejected that growth choosing to remain literally as the same child he was at the beginning so where was this Aaron the one capable of murdering billions of people all this time in truth he'd always been there what changed was our perspective in the Marley arc we were introduced to an entirely new cast of protagonists on the opposite side of the conflict and now with their perspective we were able to see Aaron's inhuman drive for freedom as the terrifying reality that it was. His friends didn't want to notice, just as those of us reading and watching didn't want to either, because we viewed Aaron as being on our side. But Aaron's drive for freedom is not admirable. It's terrifying, merciless, and without empathy. Because Aaron was on our side, we couldn't see just how unnatural and ruthless his actions were. When you look at Aaron from the other side, as the enemy, the true nature of his actions becomes apparent. No. Now, now you lost me. Absolutely not. Because you're wrong. I saw Aaron as a completely brutal... I've said it plenty of times. He was the... He's, he, was, he had the singular best villain origin story until 139 of all time i've always seen aaron as a villain i know he's i know this dude is is capable of doing some of the most evil things i get that he destroyed billions of people killed children he didn't even have to like he, he he's, he's done things that he didn't even have to do but but he did them anyways the the point that you're trying to make is that I thought he was doing these things out of from some from somewhere of nobility where you think that that's not the case you think that he he would have done these things anyways given the opportunity and basically the 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 problems that are occurring he just he's just using them as an excuse to do these things he that that he, the reason why he wants to destroy the world is the reason why he wants to destroy the world is because, um, not be, it, the, just because the world is fucked up, he wants to destroy it because of that, and he's using that as an excuse. But really, he's just an evil motherfucker who wants to kill people. That, that's basically what it sounds like your point is. To which I say, I would be okay with that. I would agree with you. Listen to chapter 131, man. You gotta address 131. You gotta Aaron do it. was someone who would stop at almost nothing to preserve the immature, selfish dream that had awakened the day he learned about Armin's book. Even though he'd come to understand that everyone was the same, Aaron continued onward in pursuit of that dream. And it's at that point that Aaron's role as the protagonist of the series switched to that of antagonist. He would continue to kill and destroy for his own sake, despite knowing it was the wrong thing to do. Aaron had become a character who opposed the message of the story representing the opposite of everything he had learned up to that point. And also, All of Aaron's and also you gotta address this. What other choice did he have? You also have to address that. His actions would culminate in the rumbling, in the destruction of the world. The rumbling was the end point of Aaron's irrational ideology, and the point at which his own friends could no longer overlook his nature. It's also the point at which the ideology of Aaron, who'd rejected the themes of the story, would clash with Armin, who now embodied the themes of the story. But before we talk about the rumbling, we need to talk about Aaron's future memories and how exactly time manipulation works in AOT. Before anything else, you have to understand that in AOT there is only one timeline, and it is the one that we see. 
There are no alternate or split timelines. When we talk about Aaron in the future, we're talking about the one and only future that is a result of the actions taken in the past. Changing the past does not create a split in the timeline. The reason we know this is true should become self-evident as we talk more about it. It's the only way that what we're presented with makes logical sense. Whether or not all of this means that the future can't be changed is another topic we'll discuss later. With that out of the way, let's talk about Aaron's future memories. When he kissed Historia's hand at the medal ceremony, Aaron saw his own future. However, the way that this happened, and what Aaron learned from this event, are almost universally misunderstood. The widespread confusion regarding this moment has had massive ramifications on the discourse surrounding Aaron and the ending as a whole. These misconceptions have even led some people to hate Aaron's character, when they otherwise wouldn't. If you take nothing else away from this video, I want you to take this from it. Because misunderstandings about Aaron's future memories have led many people to believe that Aaron is an entirely different character than he actually is. If you don't understand exactly what he knew and what he didn't, his actions appear contradictory and illogical. The first important thing to understand is that when he kissed Historia's hand, Aaron did not receive memories from his future self. He simply unlocked the last of Grisha's memories that he had yet to see. He had seen his dad's memories twice before, first in the race cave, and again after learning the secret of the basement. Why would seeing Grisha's memories allow Aaron to know the future? That's because Grisha had memories of the future that he had received from Aaron. Future Aaron had sent them to Grisha using the power of the Attack Titan. So when he kissed Historia's hand, Aaron witnessed the memories of his own future that Grisha had been sent. Keeping that in mind, it's more appropriate to say that at the medal ceremony, Aaron did not see the future, he actually saw the past. To summarize, Aaron did not look forward into his own future, but rather looked backwards into Grisha's past. But because Grisha had seen Aaron's future, witnessing Grisha's memories allowed Aaron to see the future that Grisha had seen. Okay. The distinction that Aaron saw Still the past the rather than the future is incredibly important. It tells us exactly what Aaron did and did not know about the future, and is necessary for understanding Aaron's goals. Because Aaron had seen Grisha's memories, it meant that Aaron was limited to only knowing things that were within Grisha's memories. In other words, all of the things that Aaron learned from this were things that Grisha knew as well. This distinction also tells us something very important about the nature of the Attack Titan's ability. While it was described by Grisha as the ability to see into the future, that is not quite right. Rather, its ability is to allow one to send their own memories to the Attack Titan's past inheritors. This means that Aaron could not look into his own future at will, nor could his future self send his past self memories. However, there is a workaround to this limitation. Aaron was able to send Grisha, the previous Attack Titan, his own memories. By interacting with Royal Blood, Aaron was then able to view the memories that had been sent to Grisha from himself in the future. In that roundabout way, Aaron was able to see his own future. Exactly. We know that this is the limitation of the Attack Titan's ability, because if the limitation didn't exist, there would be no reason to go through Grisha and no need to show him future events that he would be opposed to. If it were possible, it would be much easier for Aaron to simply send his past self memories directly. We also know that Grisha was ignorant regarding certain future events. As he could not look into the future at will, his future memories did not contain everything. The memories that he had been sent had been picked and chosen deliberately. So taking all of that into account, what memories did Grisha receive from Aaron in the future? He received Aaron's memories of activating the rumbling and reaching the scenery that Aaron described as freedom. He received Aaron's memories of Aaron and Zeke exploring his own memories and paths, including memories of Aaron telling him to eat the founder. He received other miscellaneous future memories from Aaron, such as meeting Ramsey. When Aaron kissed his story as hand, these are the memories that he recalled from Grisha. Grisha did not receive any memories from Aaron beyond the scenery of freedom. That also means that Aaron did not learn at this time anything beyond reaching that scenery either. But if that's true, then doesn't it mean that Aaron had no idea he would be stopped in the end? And the answer to that question is yes. Aaron did not know he would be stopped when he began the rumbling. The magnitude of the consequences of this misunderstanding really cannot be overstated. 
The belief that Aaron planned for the rumbling to be stopped from the beginning is absolutely incorrect and stems entirely from misunderstanding how the teacher memories work. The chapter said it, bro. He said it himself. Out his own mouth. While completely untrue, this has become one of the most controversial parts of the ending. It has led people to believe that Aaron spent the entire time skip putting on an act and that his entire characterization was a lie. In reality, that is not even remotely true. To say it again, when he began the rumbling, Aaron did not yet know that his friends would ultimately stop him or that the Titan curse would be ended as a result. Yeah, he had no clue. We, we got that. We got, we got, he had no clue uh, about the Titan curse. But he definitely said, um, let, "Let me let me bring up, let me bring up 139 because I gotta, I gotta bring that up <laughs> right now because man, you gotta explain this to me, bro, because I don't understand. Hold on, let me see. Hello? Excuse me. Teacher, I have a question. So let's let's read this together first so I could just make sure we're on the same page here. So Aaron, did you push us all away just so you could set us up as the heroes that saved all of humanity? That's right. All the remaining people in the world all the remaining people in the world all the remaining people in the world now owe you a tremendous debt the world will now hold you in the highest regard at least that was my plan. So if Aaron didn't plan on being stopped, then why did he say this? If you don't have an answer for this, by the end of this video, your logic is destroyed. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. We're, we're halfway done. To many of you watching, that might sound ridiculous. Yep. The belief that Aaron knew he would be stopped the entire time is so widely accepted that at first, it seems impossible that he didn't. I myself didn't realize this for a long time, and I'm sure that some of you are still not convinced. Nope, not However, at all. by examining Grisha's dialogue, we can determine exactly what he knew, and in turn what Aaron knew. Remember that because of how Aaron received the future memories, Aaron only, only knows what Grisha knows. knows. We got it. Let's go. After killing the Ray's family, Grisha stumbled out of the chapel. He begged Aaron to show him the rest of the memories that had been hidden from him, but he was met with silence. As Grisha talked about his future memories, we cut back to Aaron's kiss at the medal ceremony, the moment when he saw Grisha's memories of the future. Grisha then went on to say that he had seen what was next, and it had terrified him. But later, when Aaron spoke of the same memory, his reaction was clearly very different. This memory was, of course, the scenery of Aaron's freedom, the rumbling. Grisha was desperate to prevent the future that he had seen, but even though he had seen that future, he still didn't know what was beyond it, nor whether his actions would lead to Elgin being saved. Yep, he didn't Grisha know. did not have memories beyond that scenery, he sure so didn't. Aaron could not have had them either. Absolutely. As That's a side right. note, these memories are also how Grisha was able to see and hear Aaron inside of the race chapel. He had been sent Aaron's future memories of Aaron and Zeke exploring his own memories. That means that Grisha had been sent memories from Aaron's point of view of he and Zeke's exploration. If you pay close attention, in every scene where Grisha is able to see Zeke, it is because Zeke is situated within Aaron's field of view. Grisha is seeing memories from Aaron's point of view in these moments. He's literally seeing himself in a third person view. It must have been an extremely surreal, out of body experience for Grisha. Also, Aaron's dialogue with Historia when he explained his plan to her does not make sense if he knew the full consequences of the rumbling at the time. 
I'll talk about that more, much later in the video. Regardless, if everything I've just said is true, then when did Aaron learn he would be stopped? Mm -hmm. The answer to that question is after gaining control of the Founding Titan. Before we can talk about that though, first we have to talk more about Aaron's future memories. We'll return to the subject of when Aaron learned he would be stopped later in the video as well. What I want you to keep in mind for okay. now is that Aaron began the rumbling because he wanted to do it, without knowing he would be stopped in the end. So now that Aaron knows the future, does it mean that future is the one that is guaranteed to happen? Yes, it does mean so, but not for the reasons you might think. In many series that involve time travel, the future cannot be changed once it has been predetermined because of supernatural entities or is an innate property of the universe. Take for example Steins Gate and Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. In those series, once the future has been set, it cannot be changed barring some very specific circumstances. The universe of AOT also has a fixed future but not for the same reason. Explaining why that is requires getting into a bit more philosophy, so please bear with me. The reason that the future is inevitable is not because it is fated by supernatural forces, but because it is a direct product of the past. There is only one timeline, and any changes that will be made to that timeline have already been reflected in the predetermined future. When one looks into the future, they are not seeing a single possible future, but rather the only possible future. To put it simply, the universe of AOT is a deterministic one. The philosophy of determinism claims that all events in the universe are determined by pre-existing causes, including moral choices. This means that there's a cause and effect relation between all events in the universe. It also means that human free will doesn't actually exist. The universe of AOT operates on this principle, and this also applies to Aaron and his actions. As I talked about before, Aaron is someone whose actions are controlled by his own inherent nature. By extension, the reason that the rumbling is inevitable is because it is a product of Aaron's nature. Because Aaron's nature was that of a person who wanted freedom, because the outside world's existence conflicted with that desire, and because he had the means to act on that desire, there was no possibility that Aaron chose not to destroy the world. Aaron's past and the circumstances of the world had ensured that this was the only possible future. Again, Aaron is in no way compelled by supernatural forces, like fate or destiny, to take these actions. If Aaron did not dream of freedom, and if he did not want to destroy the world, he would not have seen memories of the rumbling in the first place. But because of who Aaron was, this had always been the one and only possible future. If that future were able to be changed, then he never would have seen it to begin with. Because there was only one timeline, the fact that he had seen this future meant that he would inevitably follow that timeline and take this path. But make no mistake, this is the future that would have happened, even if no one had witnessed it. Aaron or anyone else for that matter could not get around the deterministic nature of the universe by simply not observing the future. In a deterministic universe, even if the future isn't seen, it does not mean that multiple outcomes are possible. So okay. no matter what, the future is created by the past, and there But I have a question for you. Another question, teacher. If this is true, right? So if this if 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 it would have happened anyway, then why did Aaron send back memories at all? I need an answer for that one by the end of the class. There is only one future, even if no one knows what that future will be. Aaron seeing the future did not lock that future into place nor did Aaron seeing it change that future. If someone in a deterministic universe sees the future and tries to change it, their failure to change that future is already set in stone. The fact that they witnessed it means that their future self also at the same point in time saw the future. It also means that if their future self tried to change it, it failed. Since there's only one timeline, and the future is a product of the past, their past self is determined to follow that same path of failure. Whether it's because they lacked the means to change that future, or in Aaron's case because they wanted that future, the future will not be changed. This is also why Grisha ultimately gave Aaron the Attack Titan, despite asking Zeke to stop him. There is only one timeline, and it was the one in which Grisha was eaten by Aaron. As a result, Grisha was guaranteed to follow that same path of giving his Titan to Aaron. The reason why he chose to do so is heavily debated, but why he did so is irrelevant to the simple fact that he did. To reiterate. Hmm. I like how you just brush past that point just because it it kind of suits your argument. Um, 
that Grisha just, it, it doesn't matter why he gave it to him, he just, he just did. Even though he fucking knew that Aaron was going to destroy the whole world. Why'd he give it, why'd he give him the Titan then? He didn't have to do that. He, he could have chose not to do it. Again, he, he moved, once he moved the future, he didn't have to do it. He definitely could have gave the Titan to anybody else. Literally anyone else. Especially if he knew that he could have gave it to Mikasa. He could have gave it to Armin. He could have gave it to somebody. Or he could have told somebody about it. Like, I don't know. But Aaron, he didn't have to give it to Aaron if he knew what Aaron was going to do. It doesn't make sense. Great. In Aaron's case, the future can't be changed because it is the future that Aaron wants. And he can't help himself from wanting it. He cannot take steps to prevent that future as he lacks the will to do so. Were Aaron not someone with the innate desire to want that future and without the means to make it happen, he would not have seen that future to begin with. The realization about the universe being deterministic has grave implications regarding the existence of free yeah, will. Yeah, but you really gotta address why Aaron sent the memories back if that's the case. Because if, if it was gonna happen anyways, there's no reason for him to send the memories back. There's no reason whatsoever for him to go through the... Why? Why did he send the memories back? If it already happened anyways, like by your logic, it already happened anyways, there's no reason for Aaron to send the memories back at all. Does that make sense? So, as we discussed, in the deterministic universe, only one future is possible. This means that any choices people make are predetermined, as the future cannot change. The decisions they make will be the ones that lead to the predetermined future. To an ordinary person who cannot see the future, it will still appear to themselves as if the choices they make can change the future. Since they don't know what future their choices will lead to, it will seem to them as if they have the free will to make whatever decisions they want and that their choices can lead to many different outcomes. But that is not the case for someone who has witnessed the future. If someone witnesses the future in the deterministic universe, their illusion of free will is broken. But why? Let's use Aaron as an example. Aaron has witnessed the future that will be a result of his own choices. What he saw is what he will choose to do in the future. Had he not witnessed the future, it would have seemed to him as if he had free will in his decision whether or not to activate the rumbling. But now that he had seen the future, he knew what he would choose. Even if this is what he wanted, he became aware that he never had free will in what choice to make. This leads to a paradox related to free will known as Newcomb's Paradox. More specifically, a subsection of Newcomb's Paradox related to retrocausality. In a world with perfect predictors, people who have seen the future and can make predictions about it with 100% accuracy, retrocausality can occur. If a person truly knows the future, and that knowledge affects their actions, then events in the future will be causing effects in the past. The chooser's choice will have already caused the predictor's action. Some have concluded that if perfect predictors can exist, there can be no free will, and choosers will do whatever they're fated to do. Probably. Aaron knows with 100% accuracy what choices he will make in the future. That is to say that Aaron himself has become a perfect predictor. That raises the question, where did his idea to do the rumbling originate from? Did it originate from himself? Or did he only make that choice because seeing the future put the idea into his head? That is what lies at the heart of the perfect predictor paradox. Regardless, it is possible that perfect predictions can align with what the predictor actively desires. And in Aaron's case, as someone who saw the future that he saw it, that applies to him. For Aaron, the origination of his choices is irrelevant. These are the decisions that he would have made, whether he had known he would make them or not. I'd like to share a quote from Twitter user L. Luck, who I think summed this up perfectly. Aaron knowing what he would do in the future doesn't end up mattering to him during his actions post time skip. What he sees in the future is exactly what he would do, even if he hadn't seen it, because this future is based on himself. He is pushed by himself and keeps moving forward, because that future is what he wants and what he would do. He shows resolute determination to all of his actions, because all the steps that he saw in front of himself are the ones that he would take. Probably. It was Aaron who wanted this future to come into existence, and it was his will that brought it into existence. But ironically, as a result of knowing the future, his illusion of freedom to deviate from that future was taken away. He became acutely aware that all of his choices had been made before he had ever made them. Aaron knew that what he was doing and what he wanted was wrong. He tried to see if the future could change. 
There was no supernatural force stopping him from telling other people about what he had seen and asking his friends to help him prevent that future. But of course, because the future he saw was the one he wanted deep down, he could not muster up the will to change it, nor could he take steps to change it. In truth, even Aaron's doubt, guilt, and meager attempts to change the future were all predetermined. Because of the very nature of the universe and the circumstances of the world, their future could have never been anything else in the first place. In this inevitability, this realization of the predetermination of his own actions and the lack of his own freedom on every level is what led to Aaron's changing demeanor and jaded attitude. To summarize, the future memories are a philosophical commentary on the nature of free will. As some people mistakenly assume, this does not mean that the universe of AOT is controlled by some higher power, destiny, or fate. Rather, the future is created by the past, and the universe is deterministic. Were Aaron not someone who sought freedom, he would not be compelled by supernatural forces to activate the rumbling. Aaron destroyed the world because he wanted to do so, as it was in his nature. But as I talked about earlier, I don't believe that Isayama is saying that the deterministic nature of the universe absolves Aaron of his crimes. Just as we cannot absolve a murderer who kills on impulse, we cannot excuse the actions that Aaron took. In this way, I believe that the universe of AOT operates on the theory of compatibilism, the belief that we are still responsible for the actions we take, even though we lack true free will. And now that we have a full understanding of Aaron's meaning of freedom, his state of mind, and his future memories, we can finally talk about the conclusion of his character arc. Alright, let's see what you gotta say. Let's see how you tie As this Aaron up. Aaron walked through the streets of Marley, he thought about how in the near future he would kill Skip. all of the people living there. He reasoned that if either LD or the world had to die, it made more sense for it to be LD or going by numbers alone. But he was unwilling to make that sacrifice. He saw a child named Ramsey being attacked, and realized he had seen him before through his dad's memories. His first instinct was to intervene and help, but he stopped. He knew that soon he would be the one to kill Ramsey. Saving him now would be pointless. But once again, he couldn't fight his own nature. Aaron wasn't the kind of person who could ignore a child being attacked. Afterwards, he was reminded of the contradiction of Reiner's behavior, how Reiner went out of his way to save his friends on the island while knowing he would later kill them. Aaron had now done the same thing. No, what he was going to do was even worse than what Reiner had ever done. He realized then that he was the ultimate hypocrite for judging Reiner. Yep. Knowing what he would do in the future and overcome with the immense guilt towards his own desire, he started crying. Ramsey couldn't understand the Eldian language, so this was the one time Aaron could be honest to someone about his true intentions without reprisal. The island. It's to save Eldia. But it's more than that. What was really beyond the walls was nothing like the world I dreamed of. It wasn't like the world I saw in Armin's book. When I learned that humanity lived beyond the walls, I was so disappointed. I wished for it. I wanted to wipe it all away. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Aaron reflected one more time on Armin's book as he slaughtered the children running away from the destruction. Ever since I was born, there before my eyes stood those miserable walls. Flaming water, frozen earth, plains of sand. I'm sure that the outside world is way bigger than the one inside the walls. Anyone who saw those things would be the freest person in the world. By killing Ramsey, Aaron finally reached the sight he had seen in his father's memories, the very manifestation of the freedom that he wanted. Ramsey was the physical embodiment of the innocent dream of freedom that Armin had. What Ramsey sought was pure freedom, and Aaron had murdered him to achieve his own corrupted version of that same freedom. It was the ultimate sin for Aaron, and the betrayal of the dream Armin had once shared with him. This is... freedom. Finally, we're here at last. This is that site, right, Armin? 
Having experienced his childhood dream, Aaron brought Armin to the past to share his excitement. But of course, this had never been Armin's dream, and never what he wanted. Their dreams had diverged a long, long time ago. Together in paths, Aaron and Armin finally explored the world they had heard so much about. Just as at the beach, and again after meeting the volunteers and traveling through the outside world himself, Armin was amazed by what he saw. But Aaron had always longed for a different scenery than this, and he had already seen it with his own eyes. Aaron had long ago given up on finding the freedom he wanted in the world as it was, but Armin had not. And that was at the core of what separated them, and what drove them apart. Aaron, unable to accept the world, had become a slave to his dream. But Armin would continue to seek a way to accept the world that they lived in. He also became Somewhere a slave in to his my dream head, too, right? There was a promise I made to Aaron that so would travel the world of the unknown. I thought it would come true. No, it wasn't the world we dreamed of. But I still want to believe that there's still a world we don't know about yet out there. Past the walls. From the moment he kissed Historia's hand, Aaron knew that he could activate the rumbling, and as a result, reach freedom. Just like we talked about previously, he didn't yet know anything beyond that. Keeping that in mind, prior to activating the rumbling, there were two goals that Aaron worked towards. Let's go over those goals now. Like I talked about before, his first goal was to experience freedom. For Aaron, experiencing freedom meant that the outside world needed to be wiped clean. We've already talked about that extensively, so I don't think it needs any more elaboration. His second goal was to give his friends long lives, which required protecting the island. Aaron wanted to protect his friends from the outside world, and to do so knew that he needed to protect their home. Aaron knew that a full worldwide rumbling wasn't necessary for that goal. There were other options, but it's also true that he wanted to protect them, including protecting Historia from the cycle of cannibalism. Destroying the outside world was the most sure way to save the people he cared about, and Aaron was not willing to take any risks. His actions were motivated not with just himself in mind, but also the people he cared about. Even if it gave him a convenient excuse to do what he wanted, he still wanted to protect them. But Aaron's okay. interest in protecting the island began and ended there. Aaron never cared about LD itself, or the new Eldian Empire, so long as his friends were safe. Okay. Regardless, Aaron began the rumbling with only these two goals in mind, and the rumbling was a sure way to accomplish both of them at once. So then why did he allow himself to be defeated in the end? Let's hear it. The answer to that is that somewhere along the line, he saw the future once again. The question we need to answer now is this. When exactly did Aaron see the future again and learn that he would be stopped? And we can pinpoint that exact moment. Aaron's plans were stopped long before the Alliance ever got near him. In a deterministic universe, the events of the past create the one and only possible future. And with the founding titan's power over space and time, Aaron now began to experience both sides of that cause and effect simultaneously. The past, present, and future lost all distinction. From Aaron's perspective, the events of the past happened concurrently with the events of the future. And because of that, Aaron was once again able to see the future, this time without being limited to what was in his dad's memories. There were two relevant pieces of information that Aaron learned from this that would alter his plans. He learned that the alliance created by his friends would kill him after he destroyed four-fifths of the outside world. He also learned that Mikasa would make a choice that would end the curse of the titans. Just as Aaron's choice to initiate the rumbling was an inevitability in the future he had seen, Aaron's failure to complete the rumbling was also an inevitability in that same future. He couldn't even intervene and try to prevent them from reaching him in the first place, because Aaron had seen them reach him, and therefore knew it would happen. Finishing the rumbling would require killing his friends, a sacrifice he could never make. But as with everything else, Aaron never had a choice in the matter to begin with. Because of his imminent, unavoidable death, Aaron altered his plans and gained two new objectives. His first new objective was to end the Curse of the Titans. He didn't know the specifics, but he knew that his actions would push Mikasa into making a choice that would eliminate Titans from the world. His second new objective was to make his friends into heroes. Now that he knew the outside world wouldn't be wiped away, his final goal was to prop his friends up as the heroes who had defeated him. That would let them pave the way for peace between the island and the survivors of the outside world. 
part of that included making the biggest show of his defeat as possible. The first step in his plan was to announce to the world that he intended to destroy everything outside of the island. While that was his true intent at the beginning, from the moment he gained full control of the founding titan, he knew it was an impossible goal. That's also why he turned into a titan and began fighting Armin hand to hand at the very end. It was important that everyone there witnessed him being defeated by the Alliance. Though he had the ability to easily take them away, Eren intentionally left the Alliance with their Titan powers. All of that was to ensure that they wouldn't hesitate to kill him, and that they would have the means to do so. Just as Eren had known he would be, he was successful in everything he set out to do. Although he was never able to complete the rumbling as he originally intended, he still experienced the freedom he sought after for a brief moment, and saved his friends. So long as it meant killing his friends, Eren could not complete the rumbling. Because the one and only thing he valued as much as his own freedom was their lives. From Eren's perspective, it must have been unfortunate that they came to stop him. The ideal situation for Eren would have been if his friends had joined the Jaegerus, or refused to come after him. Unfortunately for him, however, they did. And because of his unwillingness to kill them, his defeat was assured. But if Eren didn't know he would be stopped, or if the Alliance hadn't pursued him, he would have completed the rumbling. He became- Nope. So... Nope. Nope, 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 nope. You tried it, bro. It was a nice attempt. It was a really nice attempt. So... How you wrong, right? It's, this is this. I'm sorry, bro. I, you're wrong here. If Eren really... With, like you said, his preferred, you know, he would have preferred it be this way, that they joined the Jaegerus, then he would have tried to convince them to, <laughs> at least at one moment in the story, at least once, he would have tried. He would have said, hey, y'all, check it out. This is what's going on. This is why I got to do X, Y, Z. He didn't even try. He didn't even attempt, not one time, that he tried to convince them to come on his side. So that's why this is, can never be true. Because if he really, if, it, if the only reason why he didn't kill the whole world is because he knew his friends would stop them and he didn't want to kill them, what he would have desperately tried to convince them to, because he knew that he he knew that this would happen, right? He knew that they he knew that they tried to kill him. Why would he not try to convince them? When he sent the message out to Pavs, when he sent the message out to Pavs with Ymir, because you're saying he got this memory, he he, he 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 obtained the memory that he was gonna lose after he connected with Ymir. He sent them two messages after he connected with Ymir. Why did not in one of those two messages did he not try to convince them? I know what your answer is gonna be, is he already knew they'd come. He already knew he destroyed the world. He still tried. He still apologized to Ramsey. So why wouldn't he just say, hey, "Look, it's gonna take two seconds. Either you say yes or no." But let me try to convince y'all why I'm doing this. He didn't even try. And you expect me to believe that they're the reason why he stopped it? Nah, I don't think so began the rumbling with every intention of destroying the entire world. Did you really need to go this far? Was this all for our sake? Aaron looked at him but didn't respond and walked away, changing the subject. Even if I didn't know that it would stop me in the end, I think I still would have flattened this world. I would have leveled every forest, and I would have left the land covered in carrion fattened insects a few days later. I wanted to leave every surface a blank plane. Why? Aaron thought back to his father's first words to him. From the day he was born, he was free. But even Aaron didn't understand why his own nature was that way, nor exactly what it was that drove him onward. I want to share another quote from El Luck, who I think described this best. Does he want to proceed with the rumbling? Was that an idea that was put into him first by the future he saw? 
But isn't this future something his own persona created? Did he forge the future, or was the future the one who forged his rage? Both? It doesn't matter. He doesn't know. I... don't know why. But I wanted to do that. I had to. There's a common misconception that Aaron was just acting throughout much of the story. This misconception mostly stems from people misunderstanding Aaron's goals and how much he knew about the future. Aaron's reluctance to be truthful to Armin about his reasoning, even in past, only exacerbated the problem. Just to make sure everyone understands, I want to go over each one of Aaron's supposed lies. Aaron does lie at points, but the points at which he does are fairly obvious in retrospect, especially after understanding everything else I've talked about so far. So what did Aaron lie about, and what was he truthful about? Aaron lied to Elena and Zeke about supporting their euthanasia plan. I don't think anyone is in disagreement that Aaron never supported their plan, as it contradicts his core beliefs. It should also be obvious why Aaron lied to them. He needed them to believe that he was on their side in order to meet with Zeke and use the Founding Titan. Did Aaron actually lie to Flock? Not exactly. At the time he communicated his plan to Flock, Aaron genuinely intended on destroying the entire world. Once again, and contrary to popular belief, Aaron did not yet know he would lose in the end when he began working with Flock. It's easy to forget because of where this chapter is placed in the story, but this event takes place before Aaron went to Marley. That means it's also before he learned the lesson of At the time he talked to Flock, Aaron still viewed the people of the outside world as his enemies. What he said to Flock was genuine. But did Aaron ever actually agree with Flock's ideology? In short, no. Flock and the Jaegerists wanted Eldia to become the world's dominant power. They executed dissidents and forced others to work for them to establish the new Eldian Empire. But Aaron never cared about any of that, and never cared about Eldia as a nation. He prioritized his loved one's safety over Eldia's future multiple times. Saving the island specifically, or Eldia itself, was never the reason why he did what he did. And Aaron deliberately excluded from Flock the fact that his primary goal was his own freedom, and not to help Eldia. Unlike Flock, Aaron came to understand that killing the people of the outside world couldn't be justified, but he still did it regardless for his own reasons. In that way, their objectives only happened to align. In the end, Aaron worked to set up those that opposed Flock and the Jaegerists as the heroes of humanity. Did Aaron lie to Historia? Once again, no. At the time, just like with Flock, Aaron genuinely believed what he was telling her, as he hadn't been to Marley yet. I mentioned this earlier, but what Aaron said to Historia didn't make sense if he already knew everything about the future. There was no advantage to lying to her if he already knew everything. If Aaron knew that the rumbling would result in the end of the Titan Curse, there was no reason for him not to explain that to her, as it would make her more willing to cooperate with him. The closest he came to lying to her was when he omitted his primary goal, just like he did with Flock. Aaron had told her that their conflict would never end until one side was wiped out, and he believed it at the time. However, in the end, he would trust Armin to find a way for the survivors of humanity to make peace. Aaron lied to Mikasa, Armin, and his other friends. His goal was to drive them as far away from him as possible. As you just said. But an important distinction to make here is when he started to lie to them. He only did so after he realized that it was wrong to kill the people of the outside world. Prior to going to Marley, Aaron did not lie to them outright, but rather omitted what he knew about the future, just like he had done with Flock and Historia. It's a lie, but... After living in Marley, Aaron knew that what he was planning on doing was unforgivable. He knew that his friends wouldn't be able to live with themselves if they were to help him, and so he began to distance himself from them. His cold demeanor and lies towards them only began after he returned to the island. That demeanor was not a result of his hatred towards them, but rather his own self-loathing. For that same reason, Aaron was reluctant to tell Armin his true desires at first, even in past. Aaron was deeply ashamed of what he wanted, and what he had done. It would take time and questioning from Armin before he finally told the entire truth. But let's back up. Was what Aaron said to them at the table scene a lie? I do think that part of what he said during the scene, especially to Armin, was genuine. 
probably felt to an extent like Armin had betrayed him by getting so attached to Annie. And despite his own desire to do the rumbling, Armin's lack of solutions to their current situation likely frustrated him. As someone who knew the future, it probably appeared to him as if everyone around him was doing nothing at all to prevent that future. As he admitted later, he got too into the act when he fought Armin. In the end, Armin was the only person who Aaron was direct and honest to about why he did what he did. While he had told Ramsey and he had given Reiner hints, Armin was the first time he laid it all out. Did you say he wasn't acting though? Aaron had complete trust and faith in Armin, and Armin was the only one he would share his darkest sin with. Aaron's ultimate lie was the claim that he hated Mikasa. Nothing could be further from the truth. He loved Mikasa and wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. But the very nature of their relationship was something that Aaron could not accept. She lived for him because he had been there for her when she had nothing else. But what Aaron was going to do was not something he could allow Mikasa to be there for. He decided she would never be able to find her own happiness, so long as she continued to depend on him, and if he allowed her to stay by his side through what was coming. After his breakdown in front of Ramsey, Aaron approached Mikasa one last time. It was at this point, after confessing to Ramsey, that he must have known he could no longer be with her. This would be their last conversation before Aaron left her. Aaron asked what he was to her, and she responded to him that they were family. But in the end, we saw a world in which Mikasa answered Aaron's question differently. Aaron showed Mikasa an alternate reality, one in which they abandoned everything to spend their remaining time together. But a world like this could never exist. This was a world founded on a time paradox, one in which the island ended up being destroyed because of Aaron's inaction. This world contradicted Aaron's very nature. It was never possible to begin with. Everyone had to be drunk on something to keep moving forward. And this was, in the end, true for Aaron as well. Aaron was drunk on freedom, and he'd come to understand just how that desire had enslaved him. But he could not stop himself. Forced onwards by his own nature and his dream, and losing himself in the process, in the end Aaron was literally a puppet to his own desire for freedom. And he didn't want Mikasa to sacrifice her own freedom for him as well. Please, Mikasa. Forget about me. But despite the terrible things he had done, Aaron had still been the one who had saved her on that day. She still loved him, but she knew that he could not stop himself, and that she had to be the one to do it. But even so, she decided that she wouldn't forget about him. And with that resolution, Mikasa took Aaron's life. But Aaron was wrong about one thing. Even after his death, Mikasa still chose to remember him and his kindness towards her. Even so, she started her own life and found her own freedom. Aaron did not start out as a popular protagonist. In fact, prior to very recently, if you were to check any discussion about an annoying protagonist, you would almost always find Aaron there. The overall perception of Aaron was that he was annoying and stupid, and it stayed that way for years. When the time skip happened, public perception of Aaron began to shift drastically. His popularity exploded, and for obvious reasons. The new Aaron was cool, ruthless, and had seemingly evolved past all the traits that he'd been disliked for in the past. He had turned from a character who was very reactive, constantly being pushed around by the story, to one who was proactive and seemed to pull the story along. The explosion in his popularity made sense given how his character changed. But therein lies the problem. Aaron had not changed. He'd only seemed to change. And because of that, a lot of people got the wrong idea about who Aaron was and what his role in the narrative was. Aaron was a very childish character. His reason for doing the rumbling was, too, a childish one. He didn't think it was justified, but he did it anyways. He was not a stoic anti-hero, forced to become a monster for what he thought was right. Rather, he was a child who refused to grow up, lashing out after his expectations weren't met, and disregarding the innocent people who he had to trample on to get what he wanted. Aaron's goal of freedom was not a noble one in any capacity. He would have destroyed the world whether or not he knew he would have been stopped in the end. The rumbling might have had positive consequences as a byproduct, but those were not the reasons why Aaron did what he did, and there were alternate solutions to protecting his friends was his only concern. Regardless of how pressured he felt, what Aaron sought was evil, and he caused an immeasurable amount of death and destruction for his own sake. 
It's hard to accept the truth about Aaron, especially when you become attached to him, watched him grow up, and in many people's cases, followed his story for years. We wanted to justify what he was doing, to say that he was doing it because he had no other choice. Even after his confession to Ramsey, which directly spelled it out for us, he still refused to listen. But the ending made it clear. Many of us had become attached to a version of Aaron that didn't exist. And this misunderstanding is what led to the controversy of the ending's most infamous moment, in which Aaron broke down and began crying about his inability to be with Mikasa. Isayama once said that when he wrote this line, he thought, Aaron is back. And Isayama was right to say that, because this line was the most that Aaron had been himself since he saw the future four years prior. This was the real Aaron, and this is who his true self had always been. But more than anything, I think that this line was directed specifically at people who had forgotten who Aaron was. When Armin called Aaron pathetic, I believe that he was speaking for the audience. Like Armin, we'd also gotten used to Aaron's new demeanor. But this was a harsh reminder that the true motivations behind Aaron's actions were childish and pathetic, and not to be admired. Aaron had given up on his life with Mikasa, and with everyone else, in favor of his freedom. The fact that he was complaining about it now was, in itself, kind of pathetic. At the same time, I think it's wrong not to view Aaron as an incredibly tragic character. Despite his actions, in the end he suffered greatly, and he hated himself for what he had done. He knew that he could not be forgiven, and he accepted paying the price for those actions. That doesn't Aaron sound childish to so me! Long, but in the end, he was probably the least free he could be. Aaron lived only to the age of 19, and experienced a life full of trauma and hardships. He had the right to express his dying regrets to his best friend. He wasn't a good person by any means, though we can still empathize with him. Regardless, if you dislike this scene because it makes Aaron seem pathetic, you dislike it for the correct reason. Aaron is, in fact, supposed to be seen as childish and pathetic. Make no mistake, this moment is absolutely intended to be seen as the childish whining of someone who never grew up, and Isayama succeeded in portraying that. Given everything else we know about Aaron, it is in no way out of character. With how cool Aaron had been made to look up to this point, I think that this harsh teardown of people's misreading of him was completely intentional, and intended to be jarring to those who become attached to the false image of Aaron. There's a running theme in the story pre-time skip of Aaron having his freedom restricted. He gets kidnapped in almost every arc. His tendency to be dragged around at the story's whims was a big factor in what led to many people's hate towards him. I said before that after the time skip, he had seemingly changed to a character who pulled the story along to reach his goals. But just as with Aaron's new personality, that was also a surface level misconception. While Aaron was no longer physically restricted, the story itself was now in control of him. I already talked at length about his lack of free will, and that lack of autonomy was made explicitly clear with the last plot twist of the story, the reveal of what actually happened to his mom on that day nine years ago. That day, that time, it wasn't Berthold's time to die yet. What? For one, we let him go. And made her go that way was... As Berthold was about to be eaten by Dinah, Aaron intervened using the power of the Founder and made her overlook him. As an unintended consequence, however, his own mom was the one eaten instead. There is only one timeline, and the past creates the future. With the Founding Titan's ability, Aaron now experienced both past and future simultaneously. This sequence of events was how things had always happened, and they couldn't have happened any other way. Even knowing the results of his actions, even at the cost of his mother's life, Aaron would still make this choice. Without it, and with Berthold's death, Aaron would have never been able to reach the freedom that he wanted. I've seen a lot of people call this reveal pointless or excessive, but I think it's necessary in the way that it shows the true nature of their universe, as well as Aaron's true lack of freedom. Even with all the power in the world, he could do nothing to change what had started everything. He was ultimately even more powerless than he was on the day that he watched her get eaten alive in front of his eyes. Up to his very last moments, Aaron was never free. Even if he had accomplished his goal and destroyed the entire world, I think he still wouldn't really have attained the freedom he sought after. At first he would be at peace, but then what? Once he destroyed the world, what would come after? 
Just as Aaron was bored with the world before finding out about his own lack of freedom, and as he was bored living in the free world of school cast, I think that Aaron would have not been able to stand the empty, meaningless world outside of the walls before too long. He would be searching for some nebulous feeling until the day he died, never satisfied, always aimlessly pursuing something he could never attain. Aaron is not a good person, but he is a fantastic antagonist and villain. Of course, whether you like him or not is going to be completely subjective, but I think there's no doubt that Aaron is someone who embodied, and then later opposed, the themes of the story in every meaningful way. As the protagonist, Aaron was a vessel for the readers to explore the themes being presented, but Aaron later chose to reject those same themes, and the process became the embodiment of what the story opposed. Someone who refused to accept the world, and who refused to accept his enemies. Not because he didn't learn anything, or that he didn't grow over the course of his journey. He did, but he willingly rejected that growth. And that subversion of what was being explored is part of what makes Aaron so brilliant and the ideal antagonist of the series. He is someone who became the villain of his own story. It took an incredible amount of planning and work to successfully pull off such a character arc. The hints about what he would eventually become were there the entire time, but like with almost every other development in the series, we couldn't really appreciate them until we looked back. It also took an incredible amount of faith in his readers for Isayama to have the confidence to pull off such a bold and extreme narrative choice. It would have been much easier and likely much less controversial had he chosen a less risky direction for the arc of his main character. But with the benefit of hindsight, and now with our full understanding of all of Aaron's actions, I think it's unreasonable to think that Aaron's conclusion could have been anything else. Anyone who believes that this development was not planned for a long, long time is simply incorrect. Even over the course of writing this, my understanding of Aaron has once again evolved. Significant parts of this script had to be rewritten again and again as I dug deeper into this character. I continue to discover aspects of Aaron I hadn't understood when I began writing. I feel like I've come to understand Aaron much, much better by picking him apart, and I think that's a testament to the quality of the writing. Attack on Titan as a whole is a story full of massive narrative risk-taking with incredibly rewarding payoffs. Just like how the basement reveal was initially met with backlash and skepticism, or fears that the series had jumped the shark, it was appreciated more as time went on. These days, the basement reveal is widely held in high regard. Because of how little information we had about him for years, it was a joke within the AFT community that Aaron himself was the new basement. The more I've dug into Aaron, the more I'm beginning to feel that assessment was spot on, both in how the mystery was presented and in how people would perceive that mystery once it was fully understood. While the philosophical aspects of his character might seem confusing at first, I hope that this video has helped you understand him better. I believe that there is an incredibly fascinating question about the nature of free will that is raised by Aaron's story. My hope is that just as with the basement reveal, Aaron's character will continue to be discussed and eventually recognized for the fantastic, deeply philosophical exploration of freedom that it is. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Alright, well, uh, that was a really well made video, for sure. You definitely uh, did a great job, man. Kudos to you, well done. I couldn't have made a video. I couldn't have done this much. I, 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 I aspire to do this much in the future. But now when I say I agree with you on 90% of this, like 90% of this video, I 100% agree with. I agree with that Aaron would probably have destroyed the world, maybe even if he didn't have a reason to do so. Maybe Aaron, I believe that Aaron was inherently not I believe that in, inherently Aaron was a very violent person. You got me. You got me. He's 100%. He's a violent person. I've always thought that, though. So it's not new for me because I truly, like like you said, some people maybe didn't pick up on that. And I'm one of the people that picked up on that. I, I believe you. He was definitely extremely violent, for sure, off rip. Regardless of whatever situation, he would have been violent regardless got you there um uh what was the other thing he said that he's extremely violent that it was in his nature um so his nature is violence i i agree with you there too that uh that that he 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 did what he had he did what he did um and he used the situation that he was in as an excuse to be violent 
I could even see that. I could even I I see where you're coming from there. And to an extent, I agree with that. I absolutely do to an extent. But where I disagree with you and where I feel like you're really um, giving Isayama uh, too much leeway. You're not you're not being uh, critical enough towards him in this regard. And that is that if what you're saying is true, it should have been explained to us better. We shouldn't have to have a debate on this. It should be openly and willingly openly stated. It shouldn't be open for interpretation like what it is. If if what you're saying is true, if if Aaron truly was uh, gonna destroy the world regardless and he didn't care about his friends living or or he didn't care about the world seeing them in a, in a, in a new light or whatever that that whatever that is then why did Aaron go through all the why did he make the decisions that he made why did he send his visions back to the past in the first place he never answered that but why did he make these decisions if he truly wanted if he truly felt that way if if he if he truly wanted to destroy the world why would he give up on that why would he make a compromise he has nothing to gain from this compromise other than not having to kill his friends he didn't even have to kill them to stop the rum to stop them from rumbling he didn't have to kill them he could have just had them sit in paths the whole time like armin was in paths have ymir eat all of them and they just sit in paths or whatever he had options. He didn't have to kill them for the rumbling to continue. He didn't have to stop the rumbling when um, when Armin and the worm and him and the worm separated. The colossal titans were still there. They could have kept going. Aaron set it up so that the world would see that 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 the um, alliance killed him. Why? He did not have to do that. He did not have to. If his, by your logic, his nature is to destroy as many things as possible. Why would he make a compromise? It doesn't make sense. If that's the case, then it needs to be explained to us in the story. You shouldn't have to do this. Isayama should have done this. Isayama should have told us, okay, the reason why Aaron decided to make the sacrifice, I mean the compromise, is because he realized that no matter what, he wouldn't be happy anyways. So he might as well die, Like, or this is his punishment, or something something like that but instead it's it's given to us in the story in chapter 139 that his primary objective was for them to be seen as heroes that was his reason for doing it according to the source material and then the source material says if if you guys hadn't stopped me i still would have done it so easy i was trying to have his cake and eat it too he's trying to make aaron this protagonist who only wanted to look out for his friends but also a villain who's evil you can't do both you can't you have to pick one what was his primary underlying objective what did he really want what if if, if what you're saying was true and if Isayama wanted to write this in a good way it, which it would have been fine with me if he wrote it good if he had a said if he had have started off the conversation with him if with with him saying why did you do this armor saying why did you do this Aaron I did it so you guys would look good. He said, okay, you did it for us to look good. Is that really why you did it? You know, start prying. Is that really why? Because this happened and this happened. You could have done this. You could have done that. And then Aaron goes, okay, fine, fine, fine. It wasn't to make you guys look good. It was for me. Just like in, if you ever seen Breaking Bad, if you ever seen Breaking Bad, it's just like that. When, when, um, Skyler says, Skyler asks Walter, spoilers to those who haven't seen Breaking Bad. If you ain't seen it by now, you don't care anyway. But uh, Skylar asked Walter, she's been, she's been asking, Walter the whole entire series has said the reason why he started selling drugs, the reason why he started killing people and started to become a mob boss and he did it for his family. He said that it's the whole show. Finally at the end, finally at the end, he finally admits, Skylar tells him, don't tell me one more time that you did it for the family. Walter says, I did it for me. I liked it. <laughs> I was good at it. And everyone in the entire planet, no one in the world has ever said that was bad writing. You can't find one human being that finds that scene bad. Maybe they don't like Breaking Bad, but that scene alone was excellent because 
Walter finally admitted that that was his primary objective. It wasn't his family because he could have found another way. So what you're saying is Aaron is just like Walter. His primary objective wasn't his protect his friends. It was to do what he wanted to do. But Isayama failed at portraying that to us. If he had have succeeded at portraying that to us, nobody would be upset because no one was upset at Breaking Bad. This is not this this stuff that you're saying is while there is little pieces there where you can pick it up and this is how you can contextualize it yourself to make the story make sense. I feel you because the shit don't make sense. You got to make it make sense some type of way. That's what logical human beings do. But Isayama didn't write it right. If Isayama wrote it right, Aaron wouldn't have said it this way. Aaron wouldn't have said I don't know why I just wanted to do it and if I that's like that's like if Walter had said I don't know why I wanted to sell drugs but I wanted to you fuck it up when you say I don't know why you don't say I don't know why you say I know why it's because I wanted to do it it was something that I wanted to do I feel like I'm just keep skipping past it. Uh, so when he's looking at the dirt, right? Yeah, here we go. Okay. If if you wanted that to, to be this, this would have been an infinitely better scene. You can have that. You can have that crybaby breakdown scene that you wanted to say. You want the reader to to realize that 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 Aaron is has always been this this immature child and at the end of, at the end of it and this is this is this is the reason why this scene is here okay from a narrative standpoint according to you the reason why this scene is here the reason why he's crying about mikasa is because isayama wanted to basically shock us into realizing that we were wrong on our perception of aaron which would be good writing the problem the problem is not that he's crying and that he's whining the problem is the words that he's saying with your with your theory if this were the case what he sh what, what the argument should be right now is armin should be it, it, it would be so much better if if armin was saying to aaron i don't believe you aaron there's no way you did this for us because i came up with a different plan that would have worked i came up you didn't have to kill all these innocent people i don't believe you stop lying to me and then aaron goes no it was it was for that because and then armin punches him you could even keep you could literally keep the same shit it could be the same frame it could be the same drawings just switch the words up armin punches him and says no i don't believe you you did da, 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 da. This is why there's no way you could tell me that. So tell me the truth, Aaron. Why did you do this? And then Armin, and then Aaron comes out, cries. I did it for me. I wanted to do it. I wanted to destroy the world. I liked it. I wanted to hurt people. I've always wanted to do that. Keep the same drawing. Just switch the words to that. That would have been ten thousand times better than this, and it would have lined up with yours. It would have been, I would have been perfectly fine. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Okay. So Aaron this whole time was just using uh, his environment as an excuse to destroy the world. Okay. I I can accept that as a, that's, that's good writing. I'm okay. That caught me off guard. That was a good twist. But no, that's not, that's not here, man. You're, 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 you're picking it up pieces and trying to put it into something that it just doesn't mesh because of these 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 unfortunately these panels that are here unfortunately these words that are here unfortunately the writing that's here it's not good this is this is not this is not this is not justifying your your logic and your reasoning is not su supported enough by the source material at all when it comes to this being Aaron's primary motiv mo motivation it, according to the source material this is his secondary motivation and it being his secondary motivation makes your logic completely flawed it makes the story's logic as it is now stand up more because it makes sense why it's his secondary motivation because his primary motivation was what he said before, which is why he went with not killing them or not hurting them, whatever he had to do. 
And another thing, if Aaron couldn't bring himself to kill his friends, why is Sasha and Hanji dead? He could bring himself to kill his mom. So he could kill his own mother, but he can't kill these motherfuckers he known for a few years. I, I get Armin and Mikasa, but Jean, Connie, he couldn't kill none of them. I'm sorry, bro. Like I said, great, great video, great arguments. I, I agree with most of what you said. And I do think that what you said is probably what Isayama was going for. I'll say that. I'll give you that. It's probably what it was, but he fucking failed. If that's what he was going for, fucking failed. Watch Breaking Bad if you haven't watched it already. If you don't want to watch Breaking Bad, just watch, uh, just look up Breaking Bad Walter Confesses or something like that. That's how you do it. This is not how you do that. This is not how you do that at all. Not even close. It's, it's, it's not even, it's not even in the same stratosphere of writing. This is terrible writing, if that's what you're saying. But I don't believe it is at all. Because if it were the case, then why did Isayama go through the trouble of adding the eight additional pages that definitively prove that Aaron made the wrong choice? Then therefore, he was... Isayama's own writing is saying that Aaron was wrong for saving people so then that makes Isayama look even more crazy and what's more is you're only looking at Aaron you're missing out all of these other important crucial details of why this ending is garbage but I understand the video was about Aaron so I didn't want to bring that stuff up but at the end of the day like they all coincide with one another I don't know <laughs> I don't know man can't really say that I agree with you on your overarching total message but I do think that was a very interesting video and it was a very nice attempt but uh, it'd be a no from me chief but uh, you guys go check out his video um, show him some love and like comment subscribe for more Attack on Titan content and other anime content in the future peace